Welcome to the Columbus Metropolitan Club. I'm Kelly Atkinson, the Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Director and Columbus Office Administrator for Barnes and Thornburg, and I'm also the Chair of the CMC Board of Trustees. Thank you to the presenters of CMC's ongoing Optimal Health Series, the Ohio State University Wexner Medical Center and Nationwide Children's Hospital. Today's live stream is presented by the Emergency Response Fund of the Columbus Foundation in partnership with the Columbus Dispatch. Let's thank all of those supporting today's forum. Good health really is about so much more than medicine. Even communities with the latest in medical technology may struggle to improve the overall health of their nearby populations. That's because other factors are at work in determining healthcare outcomes. We'll unpack these social determinants of health with today's speakers. Please welcome Perry Gregory, Senior Vice President for the National Center for Urban Solutions, Amy Headings, Director of Research and Nutrition for the Mid-Ohio Food Collective, Mike Primo, Director of Engagement with Community Development for All People, Jesse Reed, Director of Care Source Life Services Ohio, and our host, Greg Moody, Director of the Professional Development and State of Ohio Leadership Institute at The Ohio State University's John Glenn College of Public Affairs. You can learn more about all of these speakers in your forum flyer. But Greg, we really look forward to today's conversation. Thank you, Kelly, and welcome to our panelists. Um, our health is affected by where we live, learn, work, and play. Differences across communities result in differences in health, and to improve health, we need to understand what causes those differences. Access to clinical care is important, critically important if you're sick, but mostly your health is determined before you see a doctor, by your environment, health behaviors, and social and economic conditions. Take, for example, life expectancy. One mile north of here, in Grandview, you can expect to live to almost 85. But one mile south, in Franklinton, life expectancy is 60 years. That's a quarter century difference in less than two miles. And from Franklin Park to Bexley, there's an 18-year gap in less than one mile. So upstream differences in social and economic conditions across communities flow downstream as differences in health status and life expectancy. Our panelists are doing important work through community-based organizations to address social and economic determinants of health, linking individuals to safe housing, reliable transportation, nutritious food, good jobs, all of which improves health outcomes and avoids the hardship of unnecessary medical encounters. Health happens in communities. And I'm so pleased to start this conversation about what we can do to achieve better health for everyone. So panelists, uh, please start by reintroducing yourselves, your organizations, and from our conversation over here, you are each incredibly passionate about what you do. Maybe share a little bit about what it is in your work that brings out that passion. You want me to go first? All right. <laughs> COVID's Great over and we got people in the rooms. That's good. But I am uh, Perry Gregory, Senior Vice President for the National Center for Urban Solutions. And NCUS is a community-based organization that's been around for over 30 years, helping improve conditions in the urban community through education, workforce, and health and wellness. So you may be familiar with the African American Male Wellness Agency, uh, which our founders started 18 years ago. Um, we run uh, what we call dropout recovery high schools across Ohio, called the Academy for Urban Scholars, and then NCUS. Um, we've been around helping improve conditions in workforce working with customized employers such as, you know, J.P. Morgan Chase, Cover My Meds, Jobs and Family Service. Um, for over 30 years, we put about 25,000 individuals back into the workforce. But for me, um, I'm really passionate about this work because I think that it's such an important that um, all individuals have access to living a better quality of life, um, whether it's, it's having a good job, whether that's having good health, 
or whether it's having more access to a higher educational means. So um, we live it, we walk it, and this is my life. Hi everybody, thank you for having us today. My name is Amy Headings. I'm from Mid Ohio Food Collective, <clears throat> and uh, Mid Ohio Food Collective. Some of you may know us by the former name of Mid Ohio Food Bank, and so we rebranded in 2020 to um, really reflect more of the work that we're doing and how we get food out to people in multiple ways. And so. Really, the food bank is still um, kind of the core of what we do with food distribution, but we also have several other assets, including our Mid-Ohio Farm in the Hilltop, uh, Mid-Ohio Kitchens, which also does food distribution and some of our after-school programs. And then we have our Mid-Ohio Mid Markets, which we have several of those around Columbus that are really helping to uh, move the needle on food distribution in our communities. And then we have the Mid-Ohio Pharmacy Program, which is what I primarily work with, and it's our link with our health care providers and others throughout the community that are providing health care. And so, like for me, what makes, it makes me passionate about the work is that I'm a registered dietitian, and um, one of the things I think that um, <clears throat> is really important is sometimes, you know, in my training uh, as a dietitian, food access was really something that I think I thought was a given, but it isn't necessarily a given for everyone. And really, before you can actually improve your health by changing the way that you eat, you actually have to have access to the food that you need in order to make those changes. And so um, I've been at Mid Ohio Food Collective for about 10 years now, and so really helping to link the individuals that have chronic disease to the foods that are needed in order to make those changes is really kind of what drives me uh, in this work. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Mike Primo, and I'm the Director of Engagement for Community Development for All People. Um, we are a location base on the south side of Columbus. We are a community development corporation that works to uh, transform the South Side into a place, a sustainable mixed income community where everyone in, can live and thrive. Uh, we kind of, we, we have two different things that we do. We do direct service, uh, we do direct service programs to help people who are uh, low income, but we also do community transformation work to help lift people out of poverty and help them address systemic barriers that uh, prevent success. So over the years, we started in 1999 with the United Methodist Free Store which was just a place where people donated their clothes and household items and folks could come and shop for it for free. Uh, that launched uh, the United Methodist Church for All People in 2003, and then, I'm sorry, 2001, and then the Community Development Corporation was founded in 2003. Uh, we have, uh, we are to completely owned by the United Methodist Church for All People. We're unashamedly faith-based, but our programs are welcome to everyone, uh, like it says in the name. We do, we give our love to everyone, no matter who they are or what they have done, and we, do, we welcome all people. So, uh, in addition to the free store, which sees about 20,000 people a year, about two and a half million dollars of, of merchandise is, is given away. If we were to sell it, it'd be about two and a half million. We've done $125 million in affordable housing uh, by ourselves and with our partners like Nationwide Children's in our collaborative uh, Healthy Homes Initiative. Uh, we're on track to do another $45 million uh, this year alone uh, in, on the South Side. We have what's called our Healthy Eating and Living Program, which helps people live healthier lives. The big ex biggest expression of that is the All People's Fresh Market, which we collaborate with Mid-Ohio uh, to get the food for. We see about 30,000 people a year there. It's one of the largest points of free food distribution in the state of Ohio. Um, and we, we offer wraparound classes, nutrition, um, cooking classes, smoking cessation, yoga, Tai Chi. So if you're looking for a good Tai Chi, Thursday mornings on the South Side is where you wanna be. Uh, we have Thrive to Five, which works with pregnant moms and new parents to make sure their kids are born healthy, thrive to age one, and then enter kindergarten ready to learn. And then we have our youth development program, which works with after-school kids in two Southside elementary schools during the school year. And in the summer, we run a, what's called a Children's Defense Fund Freedom School, where we take in about 80 scholars over the course of the summer, about a six-week, five-day-a-week program, full day where we work on their literacy skills, but also teaching them that they can be an agent for change in their lives and the lives of their community. So we have all of those things. In addition, we have a couple of social enterprises which uh, we've opened up over the years. The, the latest one coming up on the South End of Parsons is the South End Cafe. Uh, I don't know where you're getting your coffee now, but it's gonna change pretty soon. So keep an eye out for the South End Cafe opening at the end of uh, June. 
Um, and so part of what I, I have worked in a lot of places all over the country. I say to people, I've been looking for community development for all people my whole life. I just didn't know it because it is a place that understands that the most important thing that we can do is build relationships, what we call relationships of mutuality. I'm not always helping you or you're not always helping me. We're coming alongside each other and going through life and helping us that way. It's a beautiful expression of community and it really is the way that we've been able to transform the South Side. So I'm very excited to be here today talking about my, my job is my favorite part of my job. So today's a good day. Awesome, awesome. Hello everyone, Jesse Reed. I'm the director of our life services program at CareSource. Um, I'm gonna start with what drew me to the work and I'm gonna bring it back around to actually what we do. So as far back as I can remember when I was a kid and when people would ask, you know, what do you wanna do with your life? What do you wanna do, what do you wanna do? It was always, I wanna help people. Help, it was just a word in my mind at the time as a kid. And so, grew up, went to college, became an adult. The first half of my career was kind of spent working directly with folks, folks with disabilities actually, uh, working in their home, working in the schools, writing behavior plans, all that fun stuff. Um, and then that kind of brought me to CareSource, which is my job today. Started CareSource seven years ago today, actually, I realize on the, on the way in today. So seven years ago, we launched this pilot called Life Services. Um, and so I was the first employee brought on board with Life Services. And Life Services is kind of the care source ward for the social determinants of health, which is exactly what we're talking about today. Seven years ago, it was kind of a buzzword, um, but now it's, it's, it's the wave in healthcare, and rightfully so. Um, when a lot of people think of healthcare and care source and you know, managed care providers and payers, you think of things like claims and all the boring stuff stuff and connecting people to a doctor. We in Life Services, kind of what we do with our members and with our wonderful community partners is we focus on the, all those wonderful things that go on in our members' lives outside of the doctor's office. Things like housing and food insecurity uh, and finding a job and keeping a job um, and social isolation and being connected into your community. So that's kind of what we do all day, every day with my, my wonderful team. So we'll talk a little more about that as the program goes on, but that's kind of me and what I do and I'm glad to be here. So thank you all. All right. Thank you. Doug, I told you I wanted to go last because they were going to come with these good introductions. <laughs> well, we're going to hear from you now again in a second. So, uh, but we can shake it up and anybody can jump in. Um, so you, you all have this intuitive instinct, I think, for how your work directly contributes to health, whether it's housing or nutrition or, or job training. But maybe elaborate on that. Pick a project or something specific you've done where it was crystal clear to you that whatever that intervention was, whatever the social support was, how it was directly translating in better health outcomes for the community. <clears throat> and anyone who wants to jump in first. Let me, I'll, I'll tackle that first. Yeah. Um, for me, much of my daily work lies in workforce. Um, and so I'm gonna talk about it from two different ways, workforce, and then I'll hit it on the health and wellness side of what we're doing. But particularly at workforce, you know, the impact of COVID-19 um, had a big impact, particularly with um, low income communities. And so for me right now, much of our work that we are doing, um, not only here in central Ohio, but across the state of Ohio, is making sure that underrepresented populations um, are skilled up and retooled for this new economy that is currently happening right now across Ohio. You know, you see Intel coming to Ohio, and that's a big thing. But we also have to make sure that our community members, um, that they have the proper skills to be able to do these high in-demand jobs that are coming to Ohio. And so um, through a number of projects, you know, we're working with the Governor's Office of Workforce Transformation. Um, we lead an industry sector partnership that is in IT, but we are focusing on closing the gap with underrepresented group from K-12 all the way up into adults. And so at the K-12 level, we're making sure that students are informed and engaged in computer science learning. You know, when we look at high schools, we're making sure that, you know, going around the hall and speaking to high schools and, you know, making sure that individuals, high school students are participating in in-demand certification programs, whether it be software developers or data analytics. And then with the adult population, you know, making sure that, you know, individuals who quit their jobs during COVID, that they're coming back and being retooled in new industries, uh, whether it be manufacturing or um, IT. Um, so we're training software developers. And what we've seen is that, um, you know, there's a big word across the community that people didn't want to do it, but it's actually reverse, and that people do want to do these jobs. But I think it's important for the community to know is that, you know, as Central Hall makes this transition, you know, if we don't get people properly skilled up, you know, you can look at cities like Seattle, where tech became one of the main industries, they saw homelessness go up. 
you know, you saw more people out of work. And so it's important for us to make sure that, you know, we are tackling that issue. Um, and then on the health and wellness side, you know, the projects through the African American Male Wellness Agency, you know, currently we have a number of different um, health equity projects that we're doing. We're working with the American Diabetes Association and Abbott to where we're making sure that um, individuals who are, have diabetes, that they have access to technology through their glucose monitoring system. You know, our community, you know, when we think about a glucose monitoring system, um, it's just something that's not being heard of. And so, you know, by coordinating with Abbott and the American Diabetes Association, we've been able to give them new ways of engagement to go about and um, engage African American men in senior groups who aren't familiar with these new technologies. Yeah, one of the things uh, for me uh, and for the Food Collective really is, uh, first of all, I just want to really acknowledge that none of the work that, none of this work gets done really in a vacuum or by yourselves. And so uh, we have many great partners uh, that help move the work on health equity. And so just really kind of one specific example is, you know, our Mid-Ohio Pharmacy Strategy as well as our Mid-Ohio Market Strategy and how those two things really come together. Uh, several years ago, I'll, I'll talk about the Mid-Ohio Markets first. Several years ago, we did um, some uh, interviews with community members, a lot, a lot of interviews with community members that were using our food pantries to really learn really what, what are the things that are needed to uh, make food access easier. Uh, and what are some of the challenges that are facing? And really, the Mid-Ohio markets are a birth of um, the responses from our community members. And what they were telling us is that we need more access. We need more access. We need more hours. And so the Mid-Ohio markets, and we have several of them uh, throughout Columbus. There's one on the east, uh, east side in Reynoldsburg. There's one at Columbus State. There's one um, uh, on the near west side, and then one that's going to uh, soon open uh, in the far west side. Uh, and really it's a model where individuals can come shop at a grocery store type model where they can have access to fresh foods on a really regular basis. Um, and so that's really one of the ways that we are able to uh, promote health equity is to give that access to people for the foods they need and when they need it and where they need it. But in addition to that, the Mid-Ohio Pharmacy Program is a partnership with our healthcare providers to help to, you know, food insecurity is sometimes um, not one of those things necessarily that always comes up in conversation when you visit a practitioner. And so uh, it's really a direct effort to start to screen individuals for food insecurity while they're visiting their provider. And then if that comes up, then what are the solutions for that? What are the resources that we can help connect to that person? And so for our healthcare partners, um, you know, we're really thankful for the work that they're doing as well to help promote that health equity in screening patients, getting them a referral to us, and then for us connecting them to our markets or one of many other places too, like CD4AP, they're a great outlet and one of our partners in the Mid-Ohio Pharmacy Program as well. So for, I want to talk about a couple of things. I mean, the market is probably a, a, a very obvious example that thanks to our partnership with Mid-Ohio Food Collective, we encourage people to come back as, and shop as often as they want. Because we know that the more often they're shopping with us, they're eating healthier, which means they're going to have better health outcomes. So that's a great example. But I want to talk for a second about a couple that are kind of off the beaten path and, and that I didn't mention before. And the first one is, uh, well, to back up, I want to, I try to, in, in, whenever I get a chance to talk with people, to emphasize the fact that poverty is traumatic. Living in poverty has a negative effect on your physical, your mental, and your spiritual health. And so recognizing that from the get-go, how can we help folks uh, alleviate those, uh, alleviate that negative experience? So, for example, this winter, uh, and, and we've done it in the past where on the coldest nights of the year, we've opened our doors just to provide a safe place, a safe warm place for people to sleep at night. We call it the warming center. And uh, we've done it periodically, but this year we, we noticed something was different, that there was a higher demand than before. So we went to city council 
And uh, we asked for some funding so that we were able to open the warming center seven nights a week for five, night, for five weeks during the coldest part of the year. And we went from seeing 20, 25 people a night to seeing over 100 people a night. They came back every night. And even though all we could offer them was a blanket and a yoga mat and you know two, in, two feet of square retail on the floor of our sanctuary, they were coming to us because they felt safe. They were able, the, the, the biggest blessing we had was when you would, you would stand there in the dark and you would hear people snoring because it meant that they felt safe enough they could let their guard down enough to actually get a decent night's sleep. That, that, that's a huge start to your day is getting a decent night's sleep and a, and a, and a healthy meal which was provided by Mid-Ohio. They, they brought us these uh, microwavable ready trays and, and every week I kept going back to them and saying, I know we said 80, but can we get 90 a day now? I know we said 90, but can we get 100? And they always said yes, so uh, a huge credit to them for that. Um, the other one is, is that we determined early on in the pandemic that we wanted to do everything we could to get folks vaccinated. Uh, it's not something you would think of as, as something we would do, but we really wanted our community to be protected, to have their health protected. So we partnered early on with Columbus Public Health. We were one of the first community-based vaccine clinics uh, in the city, and then later with um, Ohio, OSU's Wexner Medical Center. The Wexner Medical Center community care coach is on our, on our property every Thursday. Originally, it was just to provide uh, vaccination shots for folks, but now it's to provide primary care services and as a matter of fact, it's so popular, I went to get my vaccine booster, I couldn't get in. So it was a great sign of how, how well it's been adopted by the community. But, but working with the community and highlighting stories of folks who uh, got vaccinated, taking stories on social media and highlighting them to address the overwhelming misinformation that was out there and fear and concern. A woman named Beverly, I sat and held her hand while she got a shot and she cried and she cried. And when it was over, she was like, wait, that was it? But she had built this up in her mind that it was going to be so scary to get that shot. But she finally was willing to do it. And then she told her story and it helped get other people. So it's just part of the beauty of community development for all people is we're always thinking of new ways to engage with the community, to, to improve uh, the social determinants of health. And, and it's just a beautiful, and our partnerships are with CareSource and with Mid-Ohio and with, uh, with OSU Wexner and Children's Hospital and so many more. If I listed them all, we'd be here all day. It's just been a beautiful expression of people coming together uh, to improve the social determinants of health. Yeah, so there's a lot of different directions I want to go here, but I think I'm going to piggyback kind of off, off what Perry talked about with workforce development, because it's kind of what brought us to have a life services department in the first place. So at CareSource, we survey our members a lot. Again, we call our people our members. We survey our members a lot, and when we surveyed them in 2014, uh, one of the big themes from that year kind of surprised us as a company. Um, you know, it's usually things like, you know, we need help with the provider network, help me connect to a physician here or a specialist up in this part of the state. But the theme uh, on that particular quarter in 2014 was, CareSource, we love you, but here's a news flash. I don't want to be a Medicaid member all my life. Help me get up and off of Medicaid and up and off of CareSource. And so we took that as a company and kind of said, okay, what do we want to do about this? At the same time in Dayton, back in 2014, I'm a Dayton guy, so if you guys know about Dayton, a big glass manufacturer called Fuyao was moving into town at an old GM plant, and Fuyao was looking to hire 2,000 people. So it was this confluence of things where we had the members telling us, you know, help me get a job and work my way up and off of poverty, and we had a big employer coming into town saying, help me find people to work at this factory. Um, and so that's when we launched Life Services. And our workforce development spoke of Life Services is we call Job Connect, and our Job Connect program hinges on our life coach model. So. <clears throat> We have a team of life coaches across the state working with our members, and we call them life coaches for a reason. Uh, we hire social workers, we hire folks with care management backgrounds, case management backgrounds, but then we train them and certify them to be an actual life coach. Some of you in this room may be working with a life coach. Um, it's, tr it's a true life coach approach, and it's a model that low-income people haven't always been approached with historically. It's, um, our folks come to us, and the first thing we tell them is, you're not broken, we're not, look we're not looking to fix you because you're not broken. You've got a lot of strengths, you've got a lot of things you wanna do, and tell what do you see yourself doing in a year, in two years, in five years? If you're homeless and you want to be an astronaut, all right, let's step that goal out. And what does that mean? And uh, as Mike called out, there's so many wonderful kind of community partners in the community already doing all these great work. Our role at CareSource is not to kind of do the work itself. It's to plug our folks and to be that kind of social determinant quarterback, to plug our members into the resources that already exist in their community. So um, 
That's what we do generally in life services, but it hits on all. We have, we have members who have workforce development goals. They're either unemployed and they, you know, they might have a, a felony background or they might have you know, fallen on hard times um, and they might, or might be working three part-time jobs, but they want to get into that one career field. So we have over 200 partner employers throughout the state that we can kind of be that professional reference for those folks with. Um, we have folks with just housing goals. We have folks with food and security goals. It really runs the gamut. So that's kind of what we do in a, in a nutshell with life services, and it really touches on all the social determinants. So I'm really excited for these next kind of prompts to come. So, yeah. Thank you. You each are working to fill gaps, largely. Um, gaps that, when you're able to fill the gap, you can directly impact health outcomes. In a word or two, Maybe say what is behind what's creating those gaps. What are the root cause of what it is that then you're having to intervene to correct? I'd love to jump in there if I could. Yeah, please. So do. it strikes me that we're at a networking event, and you'll hear me talk a lot about relationships. I think relationships are so important, um, and they're even spotlighted with low-income individuals. Um, uh, many of us in the room, I can think back to myself, you know, you go through high school, you might go to college, but it's networking, 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 you got to meet people in the industry and uh, you got to connect with folks. And a lot of our folks that we work with, it's just a lack of connections and it's a lack of relationships with folks in their community. And it could be, you know, one connection to the right employer or to the right community agency. Um, it literally might change the course of someone's life. We see it every day. So um, our life coach, we're really, I'm really proud of that role. You hear me talk about it a lot. I spent my first year at CareSource as a life coach. Um, so it was this magical year of really getting to know our members um, and see them in person face to face and really experience firsthand kind of what they go through. Um, so in my experience, at least, it's a lack of resources. It's a lack of kind of connections. Um, and it's a lack of kind of knowing how to network, I guess. So yeah. Yeah, I'll jump on the, because uh, you hit it right on the money, but the first one for us is always awareness. Uh, through the variety of projects that we do and the work that we do, um, our number one message is we got to get the message to the people and go and reach people where they're at. And so, you know, whether it's health and wellness, you know, particularly in the work that we've been doing with black men, black men don't go to the doctor. Uh, and so we've had to change up our messaging so that we can get them excited about going to the doctor. And so, you know, that's why we have a health walk. Well, we're not just out there walking. When we have our health walk, we're doing the walk so that we can get, you know, over a thousand men screened on that day. And so that's created a lot of synergy. You know, when you think about workforce, um, I tell employers all the time, employers will say, well, we can't find talent. And I'll say, well, you just haven't went to where the community is. And so that grassroots messaging is the most important for me is, you know, how do you go and meet the people where they're at? How do you change the message? And how do you customize the message so people can understand it? You know, we're doing a project right now um, with our great partners over at CareSource to where we're doing a vaccine project and we're going door to doors. So over the last six weeks, uh, and they will tell you that we've went to 20,000 households, uh, but we deployed a grassroots outreach team and just going and get people vaccinated. So so we've been able to get like over 300 people vaccinated by just knocking on the doors. And what we found is a lot of people are getting vaccinated. And then the other thing would just be lack of resources, um, particularly in the African-American community. Um, for far too long, there's been a lack of resources, whether it be from, you know, um, treatment centers that are in there, whether it be from investment. And so I think that, you know, just moving forward is so important is that, that, you know, we make sure that community, low income communities have the proper resources. And it's not just about money, but it's also about um, connections and um, partnerships. Yeah, and for the food bank, uh, for the food collective, really, uh, when you think about food access, people are having to, and especially as it relates to health, people are having to make a lot of choices when it comes to, do I pay for my rent? Do I pay for you know something that my child needs? Or do I spend the money on food that is gonna improve my health? And so a lot of the times, food that would be helpful it gets the short end of the stick. And so that's one of the uh, reasons, you know, why we have our market strategy is to put food in the communities that is free to the people that are accessing them. Yeah, and just to, to touch on something that Jesse said, um, we, what we call it is the accompaniment model, um, walking alongside someone as they're uh, help, uh, helping them achieve their hopes, dreams, and aspirations. And what we know is that along the way, folks encounter any number of systemic barriers that prevent them from moving forward. And if they don't know, the, if they don't have the resources, if they don't have the understanding, they just throw up their hands and they give up. 
I'll give you a perfect example of this. We started a, a small program called ID for All People, which was helping people to get their birth certificates and state ID cards. Um, we've helped over 800 people, or 800 applications processed to help people get theirs. And a lot of times, it's not as simple as you have to just go down to the BMV, which we give people bus passes to get down to the BMV, we give them a voucher, but they've got to pull together the right documentation. If they don't have the right documentation, they get turned away. So it's helping them understand what they have to, uh, what they have to bring with them in order to get their uh, ID. A birth certificates is another, st uh, another issue. Uh, if they're in state, it's fine, we can help them, but if it's out of state, 50 different states, 50 different systems for requesting birth certificates, and you can't even get your ID until you get your birth certificate. So we have people that we've been working with, in some cases, literally six months, eight months, a year, trying to get them their out-of-state license, or their out-of-state birth certificate, and if they were to try it by themselves, they would have given up a long time ago, but we're constantly walking alongside them saying, it's okay, we can do this, we can, get the, we can get this taken care of. Did you know, for example, that there's a lifetime limit on the number of replacement social security cards you can get? It's 10, we found that out. People living in poverty, especially people experiencing homelessness, lose their ID all the time. And we had a guy that we're working with who had hit his lifetime limit. So the question then becomes, well, what now? If he doesn't have a social security card, he can't get his driver's license or his state ID. So what do we do? So these systemic barriers pop up all the time. And a lot of times, sometimes, all we can do is make them feel like we care. We're not gonna be able to solve their problem, but we, we're willing to try to help. And when they run into a barrier, we're gonna encourage them to stay on, but we're just gonna let them know that somebody cares enough to spend time with them and try to help them overcome that systemic barrier. Well, and in the communities I described earlier with life expectancy, when you go all the way upstream, the real correlation is always to disparities in income and wealth, educational attainment, and systems that perpetuate racism. At, at some point, that's the upstream that as a community we need to address. So then in that midstream where you're providing housing and nutrition, and it's, it's easier to get at some of those issues. So several of you mentioned resources. Um, so how do we pay for the activities you're describing that keep people well? And if they're keeping people well, uh, my question is, what about health insurance? Does health insurance pay for these kinds of activities? And Jesse, not to put you on the spot, yeah. but you're with a health plan. Uh, yes, so let's, <laughs> you teed let's me start up. With, let's start with you. Yeah, so CareSource, yeah, so our life services program, free is not the right word, but free is the word I'm gonna use in this room. It's, it's free to our care source members. And not only that, um, if, you are, if, you, if your child's a care source member and you might be a working parent and not on care source yourself, you can access life services and work with the life coach. So it's something we're real proud of. It's a benefit that we cover. Um, and not only that, something I always like to highlight is if you were a care source member and you start working with a life coach today, uh, you might go through the process and find you a job and get up and off of Medicaid like I referenced. You can still work with your life coach for up to two years after you um, kind of have met that goal because our, our goal is not just great, you found a job, it's shake your hand, it's happily ever after. We're really looking at that sustainability piece. You found a job, great. Are you keeping a job? Are you meeting that next goal? Are you moving into a better house or a better apartment or you're buying a house or buying a car? So uh, we're really focused on that sustainability piece. But yes, at CareSource, Life Services is a, is a, is a benefit for our members. Yes, you got it. Uh, I, yeah, right? <laughs> <laughs> I have to say that um, at the Food Collective, we're super blessed in the community to be supported and well supported by um, many donors. And for the food and health partnerships, we're also supported too by many of our man managed care organizations. Uh, many of our health care providers also work to support the work. Um, and so, uh, but it's there's room for improvement, definitely. And so there's really no organized way that it's supported uh, at this point in time. And so, in, and as we move forward, you know, what, what, one of the things that we hope to do really is to start working to see how can we make this really a more sustainable model as we uh, work to address the social determinants. So at it, um, we have a saying, we believe, Sorry, let me back up. Um, we're owned by, it's a United Methodist Church. We're on a bath, abashedly faith-based. We joke that we are bilingual. We speak spiritual and secular. So I'm gonna get spiritual for you for a brief second, so bear with me. But we believe in what's called the divine economy of abundance. God made everything, God made it abundant. 
So we know if we do the work, the resources will present themselves. So just like our wonderful partnerships, where we are able to provide services to folks, um, we know that when we do the work, funders present themselves, and I could, I could go on for hours about all the different ways in which uh, you know, our resources come pouring in the door. The free store is probably the best example. We have never run out. In 20 years, we've never run out of anything. Anytime we're running low, that back doorbell will ring and the, somebody will donate it in, in record time. So that's just one example. So the divine economy of abundance means the resources are there. We just have to do the work. And the folks here and a lot of folks in this room are doing the work. And I think on the city level, uh, our city government is doing the work. On the county level, the county level is doing the work. Uh, state level could be doing a lot more. And the federal level could be doing a lot more, too. We've seen it recently with uh, the American Rescue Plan and that. But the investment, the resources are there. It's just the political will to invest them in a way that can actually transform people's lives. It's not a mystery how we can lift people out of poverty. The child tax credit is a perfect example of that. That was giving direct aid to families every single month. And lo and behold, millions of families were lifted out of poverty. And then the political will ran out and it stopped, and these families are starting to sink back into poverty. So we tell people all the time, we're doing our part. On the South Side, we're doing our part. You folks have to step up as well. So the message is uh, getting kind of lost a little higher up the, the food chain you go. Yeah, I think that, uh, I always tell people, I think COVID-19 was a gift and a curse. I mean, because what you saw was a lot of corporations actually step up to invest into low-income communities. But I don't think it's enough. Uh, and I think it has to be really intentional about working with organizations um, who are oftentimes doing the work. And I know uh, particularly minority organizations, oftentimes we are shorted um, funding opportunities to really be able to provide resources to the people that we serve. You know, I work with a number of smaller nonprofits and, you know, they are coming into our office and, you know, trying to figure out ways that they can build capacity. But uh, I think it's more so on the corporations um, to, to keep investing, you know, if it's workforce. You know, I tell employers all the time, you want talent, you need to invest in talent. You know, my team is not out here going to find you talent at no cost. And so you want the best talent, you got to invest in the best talent. Well, and what are kind of one-time requests for funding versus ongoing revenue streams? And um, for me, one of the high points professionally was to be a part of the team that expanded Ohio's Medicaid program. And currently about three, a little over three million Ohioans are on the program. And through that, recognizing this connection that health is not always clinical medicine, but also the supports, and that it's legitimate to essentially buy health by paying for those supports. So, so where are those regular streams that we can perpetuate? Okay, um, I'm gonna shift a little bit. We're going to move to questions from our live stream uh, and in-person audiences in just a few minutes. If you have a question, please make your way over to this microphone now. Um, if you're watching online, please type your questions into the chat. Uh, but before we take audience questions, uh, I have one final question for the panelists. So you're already deeply engaged in partnerships. We were talking about funding. In the audience, you have leaders from our community. What is it that as leaders and participants of this community, we can do to be able to connect to your activities and, and support what you do? I'll jump in because I'm the fundraiser for CD4AP, so I'm going to take this opportunity any chance I get. First of all, we're always looking for volunteers. It is a great experience. Uh, I hear stories all the time from folks who come in the, for the first time, and they are transformed by volunteering with us. But also, we're always looking for uh, donations as well. And I think I speak for every single nonprofit in the entire universe when I say unrestricted funds. Please, folks, let us decide the best way to spend the money as opposed to allocating it to a program or another. I know there are people who have certain passions, and, and that's where they want the money to go. But we are always talking to folks about there are overhead costs that we have to incur, salaries, benefits, things like that. They're not sexy, you can't do a fundraiser for them, but they really help make the organization run. So if you wanna make a donation, you go to the number forallpeople.org slash give and make your tax deductible donation today. Thank you. Yeah, and I'm gonna jump 
write on that too. Answer is heading. <laughs> I, I, I'm going to build off of that yeah, and yeah. just you know, Mid Ohio Food Collective. Our work is uh, you know not free either, and so we are well supported by the community, and we're really grateful for it. Um, but yes, if you want to donate, you know you can go to our website and do that as well. Um, and also volunteers. You know we have great volunteer opportunities across the um, greater Columbus area as well as greater Central Ohio area. And so you can learn about those opportunities on our website, Volunteer Hub. But then really for um, just really the social determinant of health work as a whole, the work is not easy. I mean, by any stretch of the imagination. And I think that, you know, f for me, it's really just staying to it and figuring out how to work together, no matter really how hard it is. I mean, there are some major hurdles along the way that you have to get through. but if you keep the end user in mind, that's really what I try and think of, is like, I talked to even just on the phone yesterday, a patient called me and she had some significant dietary restrictions. And, um, you know, for me, uh, I'm pretty busy during the day, but I was just gonna take some time with her. I went down to the pantry to figure out, you know, with our pantry manager, okay, this is the th what she, has restricted in her diet. How, how can we help her connect with food that's meaningful for her, that's gonna help her improve her health? Called her back, got her connected to some different resources. And so, so I think just really having that will to work together, no matter really what the cost and keeping the end user in mind, you know, that people are really affected every day by the work that we do. I brought my finance guy, if you wanted to invest in us, he's sitting right there. <laughs> No, I just think that, um, just from the community, I think that everyone um, can do their part. Um, and I think that, you know, if you have connections with uh, a C-suite that you know may be willing to invest back in some community program, I think that may be your way of doing it. You know, I think it's volunteering. You know, um, I always tell people, I think the issue that we see right now in most low-income urban communities is that the professionals are disengaged with the community. Um, from a variety of ways, from understanding what's happening. Um, you know, I tell people, if you want to see what the community, go walk the streets and see it. Go talk to the people. So I think that's important is that, you know, understanding the, the issues that are happening in this community. And then I think um, this DNI conversation, I think everyone in the room is just being very intentional about DNI and really how we close that gap. What my esteemed panelists said, find, find a way to volunteer, to donate to the local nonprofits in your community that are actually doing the work and go get involved. Uh, we have a wonderful foundation at CareSource. We have an amazing community marketing team. Um, with our community reinvestment dollars, we try to support the great people that are actually doing the work with our members all day, every day as well. So go put yourselves out there and find the people doing the work and, and figure out how you can help. Back to my theme. Yep. Okay. It's CMC's longstanding tradition to take audience questions. Uh, Mantra Moody of CMC is curating questions from today's live stream audience. For our in-house audience, please join Mantra at the microphone. Please keep your questions brief and to the point. Uh, Mantra, uh, first, first question. All right. Thank you, for the, thank you to the panelists for being here. We appreciate you guys being here. All right. Our first question um, from live stream is from Kathy Fox, and she asks, what would be needed for the state of Ohio to expand care sources service area for my care ohio dual advantage plan to the central and southwestern areas of ohio i guess i'll take that one right <laughs> <laughs> joan we'll connect Please. offline there's there's a there's a lot of great people I, that's certainly way above my pay grade of how we do that sort of thing in the benefit side but i promise you we'll take that offline and figure out find me somewhere and send me an email whoever asked the question and we'll make sure we kind of connect you to the right people so yeah. And I would quickly add it, uh, as one of the folks who put together My Care for Ohio, it's currently covering about 60% of the population who's eligible for Medicare and Medicaid. It is missing other parts. The plan was always to take it statewide. The federal program is changing at the end of this year uh, that in within a year, the state will have to have an answer to that question. So now is the time to advocate for that particular program statewide. Hi, I'm Jeffrey Feld with Geosite. Um, I first 
Thank you very much. This, this uh, session has been really helpful. I personally think, you know, if we can address some of the shortcomings in nutrition, both access and in education, and we need fewer drugs, right? Because we can address a lot of the, we can prevent a lot of the um, uh, chronic diseases, I think, that are directly related to having poor nutrition. Uh, and I really applaud uh, our, our speakers here today. You're really doing God's work. I really appreciate it. So I've heard a lot about um, addressing um, access to food. So like I, the term um, food desert comes to mind, right? Where you live in a community where, okay, the only food nearby is filled with high fructose corn syrup, right? I can't get new, good nutrition. And all the groups here are doing a phenomenal job addressing the supply. So I, I, I would call the access to be the supply side of the equation. I, I was wondering, I, I've heard a little bit about demand for, for good food, right? So we could supply all the food that we want, but there still has to be a demand for good nutritional food. And that would be you know, education, like what does good nutrition actually mean and what do I do with this good food when I have it? So I, Mike, I know you mentioned something about um, cooking classes, but I was curious from each organization, you know, how you're addressing the demand side, making sure that people want the good food uh, that they that will make that they understand that it will make them healthy, and then what do I do with it? So, just as you know, from my own personal experience, like you know, I'm very fortunate that I have access to to quality food. But I joke a lot. I love cooking, and I love cooking with with plant-based products. And I joke with my wife sometimes when I'm cooking. I'm like, we've got you know, enough meals for the three of us, for me, my little my little girl, and my wife for you know four or five days, and it costs me like 12 bucks for the food here, this giant pot of food I'm making. So I'm just you know curious um, how how each group is doing the, the demand side, how, how are we uh, getting folks excited about good food? Yeah, if, if I could just start. Um, we do what, we, what I mentioned before, which is cooking and nutrition classes, helping people to understand. My favorite story is the first time I think we got avocados in the market and people were looking at them like they just come from outer space. Like, what am I supposed to do with this? And I, I, I was the wrong person to ask. I wouldn't know what to do with it either. But showing folks how to, uh, how to prepare meals using these ingredients and we did a thing right before COVID and we're getting ready to go back to it, which is basically like, you come to a cooking class, you see how the, 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 the dish is made, and then we send you home with a bag of all the ingredients, every single ingredient you need. Even if there, if you need mayonnaise, there's gonna be a little jar of mayonnaise. If you need a little bit of thing of dill, there's a little thing of dill in there. So uh, helping people to understand how they can do that and, and really accompanying them so that the first time they try it, and I don't know about you, but the first time I try a new recipe, it doesn't always turn out great. And so, you know, encouraging them to keep trying and keep at it and, and also giving them that community space where they're talking to each other. It's not just a teacher talking to the class, it's the community talking to each other. And then, well, you know, I figured out I could do this or, you know, my stove is older, so this is how I had to do that. You know, that's the other thing is there's vast differences in people's equipment. So you have to adjust based on, are you working with a gas stove or an electric stove? like is your oven work like that kind of thing if it's not what do you do so it's just a, literally that accompaniment model but to provide that community engagement where people can talk to each other and see that they're not alone and that they're all figuring out together it really is a beautiful thing and i'll just uh, build on that mike um one of the things that i just really like to highlight too is our mid-ohio kitchen team um they really do some amazing food prep for numerous children throughout Central Ohio, and they make an intentional effort to utilize the produce that we have at the food bank and the preparation of those meals so that our kids are getting access and experiencing new foods that they really might not have um, experienced in any other you know, time in their life. And so, so that's just really like one way that we're addressing that and like creating that hunger for uh, good food. Yeah, we're like this fun group. Um, so we do something called a Cooker with Dads. Um, so um, once a year we do an event where we bring, like last year we did it at the convention center. We had like 200 fathers and they brought their children. Um, and we teach, they did like a big cook off. And, it's, and we partner with Hello Fresh, and we have great nutritional food there. And we're teaching fathers how to cook healthy. And then throughout the course of the year, we have something called Fun Field Fridays, where we partner with NBC4, and we have a dad and his kid on NBC4 um, doing some healthy cooking. Our next question comes from Steve Swift. Um, 
What's formally being done around Columbus to address peritraumatic disassociation and peritraumatic emotional symptoms for all ages living in our deprived and oppressed communities? Other than what is going on at Nationwide Children's, I am not aware of other local programs working to address these issues. It sounds like, maybe is that mental health question? I don't know, I'm so sorry. Some days I'm smart, but I'll, uh, <laughs> it sounds like it to me. Um, so and through mental health, we have an initiative that's called Real Men, Real Talk. Uh, it's a community engagement initiative. We partner with the um, office of uh, the governor's office of faith-based uh, commission uh, to where we are really focusing on improving mental health in black men. So throughout the course of the year, uh, we host forums. You know, we go to churches, we go to barbershops, and we bring uh, mental health, mental wellness professionals in to just have um, safe conversations with men. You know, and what we've seen through that is you know, have a lot of professional men who are self-disclosing, you know, mental health I wellness issues. Uh, and you look at COVID, what COVID has done is what we've seen is there's really been a rise in the, in the tick of mental wellness with not just black men, but with all men. Uh, and so that Real Men Real Talk has been very valuable to really um, creating a safe space for men to talk. I just wanted to add real quick. So we have at the corner of our building at Parsons and Whittier, uh, that corner of the building is occupied by Mount Carmel. Uh, it's a health station. We give them the space rent free and we provide, we pay for their utilities uh, to provide uh, primary care for, for the community. We're now in conversations with them and as well as uh, United Methodist Community Health about how we can provide access to mental health resources on our campus uh, to people in the community. So it is a huge issue. It's one that we're in conversations about and I think that's gonna be the next stage of our work. We have time for one final question. Pardon? You're on. Oh, okay. Well, thank you for the opportunity to uh, be here. I just wanted to say that uh, my dad observed that uh, a skilled technician brought home a good income for his family, a excellent r result for the customer, that he didn't have to get a lot of callbacks, and, he, and a good uh, income for the uh, his employer, and uh, I forgot what else I was going to stand here too long. But anyway. <laughs> oh, um, and we need to put an emphasis on it here because when this uh, intel comes in, they're, they're going to pay top salary and they're going to draw the, the best technicians out of this whole area. And a lot of companies are not going to be able to compete because we don't have enough people in this area. That's how I end up getting drawn over here from Indiana. Um, and so we need to take action now, or a lot of companies are gonna be hurting or even failing because they can't compete with their salaries. Thank you. I'll hit that. Um, the return of manufacturing, he's right. The return of manufacturing is happening right here in central Ohio and across Ohio. Uh, and so I think what you're starting to see is a, a lot of uh, educational institutions, higher ed, post-secondary providers, really focusing on uh, retooling and reskilling through um, industry point. 4.0, which really focuses on robotics. Um, and so um, that is like one of the highest topics of conversation in this workforce community, but I think it's happening and I think that um, our community is gonna be well prepared for these manufacturing occupations that are gonna be coming. And if I could just uh, speak to that as well, one of the things at Mid-Ohio that um, not a lot of people know about is a program called Ready Skill, and Nick Davis is here in our uh, community, and it's also a skilling program that works to you know, take people on that path to build job skills, but at the same time to come around and support with food access and with housing support and with child care support. And so if you really are interested in that um, or would like more information, I just encourage you to talk with uh, Nick afterwards.
We also do job training. Um, we have what's called the Residences at Career Gateway, which is one of our affordable housing units. Um, it has workforce housing, but on the ground floor, it has 2,000 square feet of job training space. And as I mentioned before, the South End Cafe uh, that'll be opening at the end of June, we are going to be working with people who have been out of the workforce for a long time, specifically those who have been incarcerated, giving them job training skills, helping them leverage the, the part-time job they're going to have with us into a full-time job with another employer down the road, and pairing them with uh, training and uh, training opportunities through, say, Columbus Works and, and Goodwill. So we're, we're we're definitely working on getting our workforce uh, trained up. Never want to cut things off. One last question. Thank you. Uh, we've been talking about good health, but there's been one thing missing for me, and that is talking about the access to green spaces as a part of good health. And to be honest, while I was listening to you, I was also looking outside, <laughs> and and my my issue is that we have great metro parks here, but so many times when I go out to them, I see very few people who look like me. And the Japanese have a term called forest bathing, how being out in nature and the sun can be healing. So talk to us about how we as a community can do a better job of enjoying nature. We have time for one quick response. So, um we do, we do it all at Community Development for All People. We actually have a program called Trees for All People, which is working to increase the green canopy on the south side. So we're, we've been going out over the last few weeks and planting trees all over the south side. Uh, we're going to continue that program as well. Uh, and also working with, we have several community gardens that we manage on the south side so that folks have access to, either they can come and pick uh, produce that has been grown or they can reserve a plot and grow it themselves so they can get connected in that way. Also, Schiller Park on the south side is the bomb and everybody who could, uh, should go there if you don't already. All right, thank you. Well, I hope that you all enjoyed today's forum. I know that I learned that all of these things really have a lot to do with how we do things at Metropolitan Club too. So all about relationship building, it's all about like access and like actually awareness and all of these things. So, I mean, I'm just so grateful for all of you and all that you do and now we all know how we can also take part. So I'm glad that you really addressed that as well. So thank you for that. Please make plans to join us next Wednesday for a conversation on the high stakes of science literacy and education with a panel of experts. Thank you for our Optimal Health Series presenters, the Ohio State University Wexner Medical Center and Nationwide Children's Hospital. And thank you to our online virtual seat patrons and to the Emergency Response Fund of the Columbus Foundation for presenting our live stream in partnership with the Columbus Dispatch. And our special appreciation to today's speakers, Perry Gregory, Amy Headings, Mike Primo, Jesse Reed, and our host, Greg Moody. And let's give them all a real big round of applause. They were awesome. <laughs> And also, I want to thank all of you for joining us because we truly could not do this without you. We look forward to seeing you next Wednesday as the Columbus Metropolitan Club presents another community conversation. Thank you and enjoy the rest of your day. <laughs>